What's going on folks, Ted from Nerd Immersion here, and I'm doing a Top 10 Tuesday video on a Tuesday, so I feel like that in and of itself is enough of a gimmick, so no intro bits or things like that. Uh, there is no sponsor today, but if you like what I do here, I would say consider subscribing, right? We're approaching 70,000 subscribers, and my goal is to hit 100,000 subscribers to get a play button for my birthday in July. That being said, uh, it does help out the channel. It does help boost things a little bit algorithm wise, and it makes me feel good to watch the numbers tick up. Plus, maybe one day we'll get to snap that screenshot when we have 69 420 followers. Only you can make that happen. Anyway, uh, that being said, my patrons voted, and this week we're going to be doing the top 10 feats from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. I'm actually cutting that down from a top 10 to a top 6, as I feel like I could have stretched it to a top 10. There wasn't a ton of feats in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, but when I really looked at it, the only ones that kind of caught my eye were interesting enough for me to actually discuss, in my mind, were 6. I've already done a full in-depth coverage of all of the feats when I was doing my Tasha's Cauldron of Everything run, so if you want to see me go through and discuss each one explicitly, you can check out that video. I'll put a link in the description. Uh, but yeah, that's it. It's got to be a feat in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, and these are my top six, ranked from what I think are interesting to, quote, the best, if you will. Number six. Chef. You really can't beat the flavor of this one. That being said, it's definitely interesting in that it reminds me as most of the skills for feats or feats for skills that we received or feats for tools, whatever it was originally called in an old unearthed arcana that was left beside or behind. And it was interesting because they were going through and picking out specific tools or in this case, cooks utensils and building a feat around them that did let you do something cool. In my mind, uh, Tools, artisans, tools, cooks, utensils, the tool proficiencies in general are one of the weakest aspects of 5th edition in that if they're not thieves tools, they're pretty much useless. Yes, they tried to do a little bit of love for them in Xanathar's Guide to Everything by adding in some more stuff that those different tools can do, but how many, and this is a very serious question, how many of you as either a DM or a player have ever actually utilized those other things that those tools let you do. Now, Herbalism Kit technically has a use as it does allow you to craft healing potions, and I believe Alchemical Tools or Alchemist Supplies let you craft the Antitoxin and maybe Vials of Acid. I could even be making that up. But for the most part, having Smith's Tools or Leather Working Tools, other than specific things that your DM has created, or specific sections in certain adventures where that might be applicable, they're basically useless. And it's interesting that in Tasha's, they decided to pick the cook's utensils and only really cater to them, I guess to a little extent, the Poisoner's Kit as well. But your constitution or wisdom goes up by one. You get proficiency with the cook's utensils if you don't already have it. And then as part of a short rest, you can cook special food as long as you have ingredients. You can prepare food for four uh, people, uh, four plus your proficiency bonus. So, you know, minimum six, maximum 10. Uh, and at the end of a short rest, any creature who eats that food and spends one or more hit dice regains an extra D8 hit points. So it's almost like a cook chef version of Song of Rest from the Bard. However, that would also stack with Song of Rest from the Bard. So if you have a Bard in the party and a chef, possibly both, you could, or maybe one in the same, honestly, you could combine to be adding extra hit points if you're short rest healing. And lastly, with one hour of work, when you finish a long rest, you can cook a number of treats equal to your proficiency bonus. So again, two to six. They last for eight hours after being made, and a creature can use a bonus action to eat one of those treats to gain temporary hit points equal to your proficiency bonus. So again, potentially eight hours long, or eight hours rather, uh, to use them. And then the, the temporary hit points will last until, you know, you take a rest basically and they go away. But again, giving you two to six temporary hit points. This is, again, I used the flavor pun at the start, but it is a very flavorful feat and that it does let you do a bunch of stuff. It also is one of the rare um, feats that gives you a plus one to constitution or wisdom. We don't have a ton of those. Uh, you know, Constitution, you're pretty much limited to, I think, Durable, Tavern Brawler, and Resilient Con. 
Uh, so this is a nice change for that. And again, it would be interesting because you could build a character around this feat if you wanted to. Number five. Telekinetic. This one, uh, not so much for the mage hand part, but more for the second dairy, the bonus action ability here. But it gives you an increase to a casting stat, uh, or what I would consider a mental stat, which also seems to be casting stats. Intelligence, Wisdom, or Charisma, which is, again, nice in that it gives you those three options. There's not a lot of specific feats for Intelligence or Charisma either. You basically have, I think, the Resilience, and then for Intelligence, you at least have Linguist and Keen Mind, and I think for Charisma, it's pretty much just Actor. Um, at least there might be some from Xanathar's that I'm forgetting, but you learn a Mage Hand cantrip. So not only do you get a plus one to one of the mental ability scores, you also get the Mage Hand cantrip. You can cast it without verbal or somatic components, and it's invisible, which is great, because to cast Mage Hand normally, I think it only has verbal and somatic components. So now it's non-counterspellable, not that people would probably be counterspelling your Mage Hand, but they can't do it because they can't tell that you're casting it. And it's invisible, so it gives you some of the best aspects of the Arcane Trickster. And here's the funky part that a lot of people have issue with, so that's why I'm kind of not including it here. It says if you already know this spell, its range increases by 30 feet when you cast it, and its spellcasting ability is the one tied to the feet, uh, the one you chose. So if you choose Intelligence, it's an Intelligence-based Mage Hand, Charisma, it's Charisma, and so on. Problem is, if you read Mage Hand, it specifically states in Mage Hand that the hand vanishes if it is ever more than 30 feet away from you or if you cast the spell again. So the problem with that is, yeah, you could increase the range to 30 feet, and it's now 60 feet to cast the spell, which the range of Mage Hand is indeed uh, 30 feet. But the way things are written, it doesn't say... It says its range increases by 30 feet. It doesn't also say that the hand doesn't disappear. Like, you could argue that the range is supposed to cover both of those, but this is a weird issue of specific versus general, where it specifically states that if the hand ever moves more than 30 feet beyond you, it disappears. And if the range is 60 feet, it's useless past 30 feet because of the way it's described in its flavor text. I believe that this should be 100% eroded, and I'm sure that the intention of the developers when they made this feat was that it is, in fact, 60 feet and more than 60 feet it vanishes. But it's worded kind of funky in that respect. But the big crowning jewel of this is its bonus action. As a bonus action, you can try to telekinetically shove one creature you can see within 30 feet of you. When you do so, the target must make a strength saving throw based off of the ability score that you used from this feat or be moved five feet away from you. Any creature can willingly fail this save. So, for one, certain classes that don't have access to a lot of bonus action utility that could make use of this, i.e. the wizard, a uh, charisma-based one for the paladin, who don't typically have a lot of bonus action utility. They do have some, but now they have something that they can, in theory, do every turn. Um, and it doesn't actually say that you need to have the mage hand present to do the shoving. It says, and they have to be within 30 feet of you, which is also interesting that if before you can set your mage hand out to 60 feet based on the wording from before, yet they limit the telekinetic shove to only 30 feet, which further explains the fact that it is not tied to the hand. You don't have to have mage hand out. You can just shove somebody with your mind, which again, very cool. It is only a five foot push. You can't knock them prone, but in my mind, that would be a little bit overpowered. But this could free you up to move without opportunity attacks, depending on the very specific um, layout of the scenario. You could push somebody off a cliff, through a doorway, next to an ally, so if they try to move on their turn, they prompt an opportunity attack. Lots of good utility for that bonus action. So it's definitely worth taking. And again, even if you didn't have Mage Hand already, minus the funky wording, it's free, invisible, you know, non-detectable Mage Hand. Uh, and it gives you an ability score bump of plus one. So really, it's it's definitely very powerful. Number four. Piercer, in my mind, is the best of what I'll call the weapon feats uh, because it doesn't necessarily have to be a weapon either. It's just when you deal that type of damage from an attack, uh, these feats trigger. And I think this is the best one because it's, I feel like, the most usable all the time. So it's strength or dexterity plus one. 
Once per turn, when you hit a creature with an attack that deals piercing damage, you can reroll one of the attack's damage dice and must use the new one. So it's sort of like a mini savage attacker in that it lets you reroll. Uh, again, obviously, if you're going to be doing piercing damage, no one likes when you do you get a great shot off or a great stab or something like that, and you roll a one on your d6 or your d8 or whatever. This could turn that around or at least give you an opportunity to do so. You have to choose the new roll, but it's an option. If you crit, then that gives you two dice. Maybe one rolls really high, one rolls, rolls low. You could fix that. Um, and then again, if you're using something like sneak attack, that does the sneak attack damage does whatever the damage you're dealing. So if you stab someone for piercing damage with sneak attack, all of the sneak attack dice are also piercing damage. But it is only one singular die, but it's again, has its utility. And then also, I feel like the third kind of on a critical hit ability is also very useful and doesn't require additional setup of any kind um, and isn't really, it's just always useful. When you score a critical hit with piercing damage to a creature, you can roll an additional damage die when determining the extra piercing damage the target takes, right? The um, the slasher one, maybe they don't, maybe they have other abilities and they don't need to make an attack roll, so there's no disadvantage for them. And crusher is advantage on, you know, other attack rolls, which potentially could be useless for you if you don't have any extra attacks or you crit on the last attack, it has no benefit for you. And depending on what your party does, if they are non-attacker types, right, if they're all spellcasters with save DCs primarily, Crusher has no use really for them. Whereas Piercer, if you're hitting with this, you're probably only going to take this if you're attacking, and you deal a crit, it's always just going to deal more damage. And potentially, it could be re-rolled with the ability from before, you know, the middle ability. So I really like this one a lot. Number three. Gunner. I think Gunner is one of the best ones out there. Um, again, it's on this list, but I, it is essentially in a lot of ways a replacement for Crossbow Expert, and I really like that. So it gives you, uh, first of all, Crossbow Expert does not increase your dexterity or any ability score. This one does. It increases it by one. Crossbow Expert doesn't give you proficiency in crossbows of any kind. This gives you proficiencies with firearms, which is canonically really the only way to do that. Yes, there have been relatively accepted third-party ways to, to get access to firearms, like Matt Mercer's uh, Gunslinger or the Dark Tides of Bilgewater Renegade, but this is the only official way for you to get access to firearms and use your proficiency. It also, similarly to Crossbow Expert, allows you to ignore the loading properties of firearms. For those of you unaware with how loading works, if we go ahead and mouse over it, it will tell us that because of whatever's involved with it, the intensity, uh, you can only fire one piece of ammunition from it uh, when you use an action, bonus action, or reaction to fire it, regardless of the number of attacks you can normally make. I've witnessed this myself where people don't realize this, but if you're a fighter with four attacks and you shoot a gun, you can only ever shoot one bullet even though you had four attacks because the loading property limits you to only one attack. Ignoring the loading property would allow you to make as many shots as you are allowed to make attacks. Same thing with a crossbow, right? So typically, if you're going to be a higher level person using a crossbow, if you're a fighter or someone with multiple attacks, it benefits you to take crossbow expert or just use a regular old longbow or shortbow and make as many attacks as you need. This allows you to do the same thing for firearms and gives you one of the best, if not the best abilities of crossbow expert as well. When a creature is within five feet of you, uh, you don't that doesn't impose disadvantage on your ranged attack rolls. Mind you, this is ranged attack rolls. It's not just ranged attack rolls with guns. This can be ranged spell attack rolls. You can take the gunner feet with no intention of ever using guns and just using that for your bow to give you non-disadvantage with a bow in melee range. Again, crossbow expert has the ability where you can do the extra attack as a bonus action with a one-handed weapon with a loaded hand crossbow. Uh, so that could be more useful. But basically, unfortunately, this is the closest thing we'll ever get those two feats to point, point blank shot in 5e, allowing you to fire in melee with a bow at no disadvantage. Number two. Fey Touched. While Shadow Touched is good, Fey Touched just gives you that much more variability, and I really like that. It gives you a plus one to intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. Again, useful for the casting stats. 
Uh, you learn Misty Step and one first level spell of your choice. Misty Step is never a not useful thing to have. One free Misty Step is always great, even if it is once a long rest. Um, and then you can cast both the Misty Step and the first level spell of your choice from the Divination or Enchantment School of Magic once per long rest without expending a spell slot. It also has the critically crucial wording in that uh, you can also cast these spells using spell slots you have of the appropriate level. So it also goes on to say once you cast either of these spells, you can't do cast it in this way until you finish a long rest. And the ability tied uh, ability used for these spells, again, not specific for Misty Set, but maybe for the other ones, is either the Intelligence, Wisdom, or Charisma you chose when you pick when you pick the feat in the first place. So importantly, this could be so. For example, I think Oath of the Ancients Paladin, for example, is one of the best paladins out there, and one of the very useful things they get at second level or at fifth level rather is access to Misty Step uh, as an Oath spell. Um, but if you were to choose a different style paladin, for example, and take Fey Touched, you would learn Misty Step, and you'd be able to cast it with your spell slots, having it essentially auto-prepared all the time and castable from spell slots just because of this feat. Again, bards don't have access to Misty Step. If you took the Fey Touched feat as a bard, you would now have access to Misty Step all the time. Uh, and then again, you get to choose that first level spell. So let's take a look at what those spell options are. I meant to sort this by first level, so let's go ahead and refilter that. But that's going to be, some of these have a lot of uses, some of them not so much. Animal Friendship has its uses. I don't particularly like Bane. A lot of people do, though. That can be very useful. Again, remember, this will be once a long rest, so you're going to want to make it be useful. Um, Beast Bond. Uh, has a duration of 10 minutes. Again, Animal Friendship is a duration of 24 hours, so that's a lot of bang for your buck for one spell. Uh, Bless, I would say, is also super useful. Uh, some of these also don't rely on your casting stat, so depending on if you wanted to take it to just top off, let's say, your intelligence from like an 11 to a 12, you could take Bless, and it doesn't matter that you primarily focused on Charisma or Wisdom. Bless doesn't use your ability score. Uh, we have Charm Person and Command, both useful. Compel Duel, this is again a Paladin spell typically, getting access to that. Comprehend Languages, again it's a ritual spell, but you knowing it is never a bad thing. The Detect Spells, Evil and Good Magic and Poison and Disease, again a freebie Detect Magic, nothing to shake a stick at. Dissonant Whisper is not super commonly accessible, a great spell and has a lot of battlefield control. Um, if you have access to the Explorer's, Wide to, Explorer's Guide to Wild Mount Spells, you have Gift of Alacrity. Lasts for 8 hours to give you a D8 to initiative rolls. Heroism, useful. Probably two of the best uses for it, though, would either be Hex or Hunter's Mark. Especially if you have things like multiple attacks and not a great use for your bonus action, for example, like a Paladin. Having either Hex or Hunter's Mark to apply to someone as a bonus action to then follow up with two attacks very useful as long as you can keep it up um identify again super useful to have you might not need it all the time but if you were to happen to have this as your one fate touched spell you'd make use of it for sure sleep outclassed at higher levels but still useful uh speak with animals can definitely ruin encounters if dms don't prepare for that and that's very useful to have and then lastly we have tasha's hideous laughter again another single target a control spell, however, it uh, you know, just single target. So, anyway, there you go. Number one. And last but not least, my personal favorite and my number one pick here would be Skill Expert. While I do miss the Practice Expert feat that we got originally in the Unearthed Arcana, which had the benefit of giving you either a skill or a tool. I greatly appreciate this one in that it is exceptionally versatile. It lets you pick an ability score of your choice to increase by one, which is useful if you don't have a lot of options for feats that are in the particular ability score you're trying to increase. It gives you proficiency in a skill of your choice, which an extra skill proficiency is always useful. And then choose a skill for which you are proficient, and you now have basically the rogue or the bard's expertise adding double proficiency bonus to that particular skill. So you could, in theory, take a skill with Skill Expert from this feat and then choose to get expertise in that, which could be interesting and makes sense possibly a roleplay-wise. You just learned Arcana, and now you have expertise in it as well from this feat. 
You could use this to just get an, a skill that you don't have and an expertise in one that you think is more useful. It just has an unlimited use of uh, a lot of uses. It's also one of the only ways to get an expertise in a skill uh, on you know of any skill without having to be a specific race or or a bard multi-classing bard or rogue so this would be a way for a fighter or a barbarian let's say to get expertise in athletics for those grapple checks so very useful a lot of interesting ways you can make use of it and the versatility is really appreciated i would like to have seen more feats with this kind of versatility from tasha's but who knows maybe we'll get them in a future book that's it, folks. Uh, again, sorry it's only top six. The other feats didn't call out to me enough to really want to talk about them and explain why I like them, because I don't like them enough to add them into the video. So thank you all so much for watching. Thank you to my patrons over on Patreon for continuing to support me and the channel. I will see you all next time.